Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 10th, 2022 meeting of the Penfield Planning Board. We have uh, some special guests here with us this evening who are going to lead us in the pledge. We have uh, Weeblow's Den from Cub Scout Pack 80. Welcome, guys. <laughs> and uh, if you would, help us say the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, terrific job. Terrific job. You are welcome to stay for the duration of the meeting. It's going to be a fairly lengthy meeting. We start off with a work session and then we go to a public hearing. And what that means is that uh, the public hearing gives the opportunity for members of the public to comment on uh, the things that we do. And what we do on the planning board is um, what's called site plan and subdivision approvals. So let's say somebody has a big piece of land and they want to build a bunch of houses and neighborhood they come before us with those plans and we take a look at them and uh, the town staff uh, engineers and public works people and fire marshal and everybody looks at those and reviews them to make sure that uh, they're appropriate and acceptable and the site plan part is um, uh, let's say Target wants to build a new store, or um, uh, tonight we have a car wash and uh, dry cleaners. So if you're more than welcome to stay and see how that goes, or if you have homework to do, that's okay too. <laughs> so Lori, would you please call the roll? Sure. Hetsky. Hetsky here. Aiken. Aiken here. Burton. Burton here. Kanauer. Kanauer here. Tidings, absent. Sangster. Sangster here. Weishar. Weishar here. O'Connor. O'Connor here. Dubrak. Dubrak here. Gray here. Okay. We have minutes from February 10th, and hopefully everybody's had an opportunity to review them. Maybe we can entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Hetsky. Hetsky, aye. Aiken. Aiken, aye. Burton? Burton, aye. Knauer? Knauer, aye. All right, so I guess my sales pitch didn't really go over that well. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. <clears throat> I don't know why they don't find it as exciting as we find this. <laughs> All right. Doug, you want to start going through our table items? All right, table application number one is the past stone development. Um, Again, we have no new information. Um, still waiting on revised plans and responses. Um, so no action is required by the board tonight. Okay. Our second tabled application is the Arbors at Penfield. Uh, since our last meeting, we've received responses to the tabling resolution and to the PRC memo. Uh, we did just, as, long, as well as revised plans, we did just receive those today. Um, so we will provide you physical copies for further review at, at subsequent meetings. Um, they, Mark Valentine also appeared on their behalf last night before the town board um, to discuss the um, sidewalk waiver, the sidewalk waiver uh, from the town sidewalk policy. Um, the town board discussed it last night but ultimately chose to table it pending um, future review and um, potential additional information uh, from the applicant on how the sidewalks are going to connect. Um, interconnect between the, the neighboring properties and the suitability of the multi-use trail as uh, functioning as a substitute uh, for the sidewalks along the frontage. Okay. And before you leave that topic, um, what was Mark's uh, general thoughts on what they're proposing to replace our conventional sidewalk with? Um, <coughs> Mark really gave an objective overview. They brought up the site plan and reviewed it, uh, the phase one site plan with the town board, um, reviewed it with them, uh, looking at the width of the sidewalk, um, 
the function of how it would work. Um, so they did address, or Mark did address, you know, the potential for additional connection points to bring it out to 250, especially that one being further away from the road. Um, they also discussed the requirement in the, that um, if they did look at it as being uh, uh, acceptable for a waiver, that um, public access would need to be, um, you know, there would need to be a concrete way to enforce um, the public accessibility that these would function essentially the same as having dedicated sidewalks along the property frontage. Um, so the largest points were, uh, or the, the most significant points that they discussed were, um, you know, <coughs> the potential to move the sidewalks a little closer onto the 250 side, um, you know, the potential for them to show how their multi-use trail would be able to easily interconnect to neighboring properties and future developments um, so that they didn't just end up with a bunch of awkward stubs. Um, as well as um, the potential um, sidewalk fee waiver and uh, what the fee cost would be. This is the first sidewalk waiver we're looking at within the mixed use district. Mm -hmm. um, the other applications so far have either not requested it or have installed sidewalks along the frontage uh, for their property. So the town board did request additional time to um, conduct a more thorough review uh, of the proposal and potentially request additional information from the applicant as well as the planning board. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, probably should continue tabling this yep. based on, you want to move? Sure. Bob? I'll move that we continue table this application. I'll second it. All right. Hetsky? Hetsky, aye. Aiken? Aiken, aye. Burton? Burton, aye. Knauer? Knauer, aye. Okay, so just a little point. We have two members sitting there for the work session portion of the meeting. We're trying to do the best job we can for our work sessions that uh, we used to sit around the table in the back so if it looks kind of strange it's because we're trying to uh, create as much normalcy as we can with the the way the TV cameras are set up and all that stuff so there's two board members sitting there just so you know <laughs> okay in the line of fire in the line of fire <laughs> right. exactly all right, uh, tabled application number three is the Penfield Heights application. Um, staff received revised plans at the end of February um, and uh, responses to the latest tabling resolution and PRC memo. Um, one of the requests of that PRC memo was a lighting or photometric plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the, one of the newer submissions that they have provided um, since the last meeting is a photometric plan. Um, the biggest takeaways from the photometric plan is, you know, they revised some of the lighting up by building A and building F. Those two buildings changed from their previous submission uh, in terms of size and layout, and they revised the lighting accordingly. Um, additionally, they're providing um, pedestrian scale baller lighting around the outside ring of the uh, multi-use trail uh, around the stormwater management pond in the, in, on the, the east side of the property. Um, they are not proposing at this time any lighting along the west side of that trail um, between um, exte required exterior lighting on the building as well as any of the porch lighting. It may be sufficient to adequately provide lighting for the sort of the west side of the pond. You're talking about right by building E. Right by building E, correct. One thing that I noticed, I couldn't find the up-down cylinders on there anywhere. So I'd like to know what, where those are proposed to go. Okay. And part of it is I, I do know in printing that this map, it, the locations of the fixtures are not always easy to ascertain on this map. 
Um, so that was something I believe we requested the last time too, was they um, make the location of all the lighting a little bit uh, more accessible. Mm -hmm. And but we can certainly request that and uh, a detailed cut sheet of the bollard light. I'm sorry. So you're saying that on the back side of building E where the pond is, they think that the light fixtures attached to the physical they're not building are going to be sufficient to light the. So what there it appears is that the the part of the trail that's closest to building E yeah. on the pond side of building E that yes you're correct with that assumption. Okay, so that kind of it's concerning and that it it's a pond, a body of water, small children. I would think that people would want it to be as well lit as possible at night. And so there's there is certain so in addition the the darker circles that you're seeing on the the plan there are, are sort of the lighting areas around um, potential lights on the the east Cancer and the south side. Can you zoom in on the area. west side. There are three exterior entrances, primary man doors to the building. Each of those is going to be required to have exterior lighting. Keep zooming. Um, additionally, um, there's a number of porches. Um, serving individual units, which will also have their own exterior lighting. Um, so between the light flood from um, the building mounted lighting as well as whatever residents keep on may be sufficient. I, I would leave it up to the board if you guys are comfortable I, if you'd like. I mean, right now lighting. I'm looking at 0, 0 0.0 foot candles based on the uh, rendering that they did. But that's not take, I'm sure that's not taking into account any building. I don't believe so. Which and it, and is it probably again why I want to see yeah. the uptown cylinders. <clears throat> you can't and you can't rely on the residents to keep those lights on. They might be out of, they might go to Florida for the winter. You know, right. they might work. Not you. You don't. You just don't know. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. I'm I'm kind of with you with the have the bollards go around the west side too. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, provided with their responses uh, was a response to a request of the board uh, to show a diagram and percentage of uh, indicating the percentage of building D that exceeded uh, the 55 foot height requirement. Um, they did provide a diagram. Uh, of that indicating that you know if you're looking from the 250 side the west side of the building looking east uh, approximately 0.7 percent of uh, the square footage of the roof would be above that if you're looking from the east looking west uh, so you're at the back of the building looking looking towards 250 approximately four percent of the building's uh, roof line exceeds 55 percent or 55 feet Okay. So I think we need to to just note for the record here that uh, due to some unfortunate technical difficulties with mm -hmm. uh, with how we get our information from uh, the town staff, um, the information was unavailable to us until a, a recently, very recently. So um, there's some new information on this application that uh, uh, we haven't been able to thoroughly review and, and vet um, and that's that's one of those things yeah. so so we're going to continue to review that um, any other summations you want to make on this Doug before we move on uh, no those are the uh, two major uh, uh, third item um, again this was a recent discussion with the applicant they provided um, Two scenarios. So one of the requests in the last tabling resolution was for them to consider they're at approximately 17.2 percent non-residential. Was to consider uh, ways getting up over 20 percent. They could get up over 20 percent. Um, they did provide um, two scenarios, um, just sort of uh, ideas on what they could do to reach 20 percent within the development. Um, so I don't think we go through those right now because okay. um, the information just became available today. 
Um, so um, for, for that reason, um, we need to continue to table this application. All right, why don't you move it? Move to continue tabling. I'll second that. Okay. Hetsky? Hetsky, aye. Aiken? Aiken, aye. Burton? Burton, aye. Knauer? Knauer, aye. All right. Um, we, uh, an update on our held item, um, based on the conversation at the last board meeting, a letter was sent to the applicant requesting response by our April 28th work session. Um, that has been an old item before the board going on two years now. Um, so we just wanted to see where they're at. Uh, one last item, we have one new business item. Um, the scores of subdivision, 1700 Baird Road was originally approved uh, back in February of 2021. They just came up on their one year uh, for approvals. They are requesting a 90 day extension uh, to get the plot filed and to finalize some site plan, um, get the final milers before town staff for signatures. Okay. I, I don't, is there any reason why we, that they initially said they were pausing just due to the cost of lumber um, during COVID. Yeah, I, I don't have any <laughs> I, don't I don't personally have any issues. I, no. Anybody? I, no. I think though, as we've done in the past, um, I, I think we should give them 120 um, if you're going to give them 90, give them 120. If there's another hiccup, they don't have to come back and ask for <coughs> permission to Absolutely. extend. So we can do that. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. I will second. Hetsky? Hetsky, aye. Aiken? Aiken, aye. Burton? Burton, aye. Knauer? Knauer, aye. Okay. I believe that ends our work session portion. Correct. Um, I think what we want to do right now is maybe take a five minute uh, recess while our two board members who graciously volunteered to sit across the Red Sea from us <laughs> um, come on back up. And then our first applicant uh, will begin the public hearing as soon as TV's ready and all that stuff. But. Uh, first applicant on the agenda is Marathon. Um, so we putting them there or there? Where's the, where's the, um, it's over here. Table, yep. Okay. So if you want to, do you have your laptop that you want to, you kind of want to drive the bus with your presentation or do you? Okay, so Catherine can work. Okay, so come on up here and get yourself situated and then we'll begin as soon as everybody's ready to go. So for now, we'll be in a short recess. Okay, well thanks everyone for that short recess and we'll begin the public hearing portion of our meeting. Our process works in the following way. The applicant will present their uh, project to the board. Board will then ask what questions we have that come to mind at, at that point in time. 
and um, once that's complete, we'll open it up for audience and participation from the public. The public participation can take a variety of forms. Number one, which is, I guess, preferred, uh, is in person. You're welcome to be here in the town hall auditorium and make your comments in person uh, on the public record. And when that happens, I'll if you raise your hand, I'll call you up as I see you. Do we have any slips? We do. So um, there's also paper slips at the front entry. So if you want to write your name down and which application you'd like to comment on, you can do that as well. So I'll ask you to come up. You sit at the table here at one of those two microphones. And please give us your name and address for the record. And then address your comments to the board. And uh, we welcome all those comments. Alternatively, you can comment uh, via telephone. Our phone number here is 585-340-8771. And there's a control center uh, here at the town hall monitoring the phone system. And they will put you in the queue to make your comments via telephone. The third alternative is via the web or electronic transmission. And if you go to penfield.org, on the front page or the home page of the website should be a link to this meeting. And that will then take you to a place, uh, you should be able to see a link where you can um, you know, type in a comment and send it over electronically. Okay, with that, Doug, please read our first application. All right, application number one, Marathon Engineering, 39 Cascade Drive, Rochester, New York, 14614. On behalf of Sahar el MD, requests under Chapter 250, Article 12-12.2 of the Code of the Town of Penfield for preliminary and final site plan approval for a 4,018 square foot asphalt pavement expansion throughout the property in several locations with associated site improvements on 0 0.629 acres located at 1527 Empire Boulevard. The property is now or formerly owned by Creek Ranch LLC and zoned Limited Business LB. Application number 22P-0004, SBL 93.19-1-001. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Cole Pepisergi with Marathon Engineering. Um, here on behalf of uh, Dr. Sahar and uh, Creek Ranch at LC. Um, today we are here requesting site plan uh, approval for the uh, previously added impervious pavement um, onto the property. Um, the property is located about 1,000 feet south of Plank Road on Empire Boulevard. Um, there are two entrances to the site, one on the north property line and one on the south property line. The one on the south property line is the one that's mainly used by the, um, the property um, or the business. There's some parking in the back. Um, there was some limited parking in the back previously. Um, they have added now approximately 4,000 square feet of pavement um, to uh, add parking areas and widen the existing drive slightly. The, we have now added um, some stone diaphragm since we've been involved um, to help treat and capture some of that runoff that was um, added. And we have sent, or we've received comments from the town and addressed all of those. But ultimately this one's, I think, pretty simple. Let you open it up to any questions. Okay, Bob, you wanna start? Uh, yeah, a couple questions for staff. Adding the 4,000 square feet of impervious, did that create any issues with drainage that wasn't mitigated or? Well, no, so our code requires anything that's over 6,000 square feet mm -hmm. per the old IWC standards, but we also have water quality section in our design standards. It also takes that 6,000 square feet. We were more worried with this project being so close to the steep uh, slope EPODs that we wanted to try to create 
some way for the water that's running off the parking lot to enter that stone diaphragm and then kind of level it out and kind of spill out as okay. sheet flow rather than a pinpoint discharge. So they, they've they added that to the plans and staff's fine with <coughs> what they've provided. Okay, so that looks looks good. Yep. Okay. And for for the applicant, the the purpose of widening that driveway that goes out to Empire, uh, why was that done? Um, I believe mostly because there was some um, uh, dirt areas from cars that would pull on um, incorrectly, so the slightly widening in it would okay. you know, prevent that unsightly area of dirt versus a nice grass area. Okay, is there an intention between the curb within the right of way to also pave that area? Because right now it's it's just dirt. Right now on the other side there's sidewalk. Um, so they can't they wouldn't be able to There is a section there is a section though that I believe is is dirt in there too. In the tree lawn? Uh, between between the roadway and the brick or masonry fence what, line, uh, yeah. there's no intention at, at this point to do to add Pardon? any more to add any more impervious or add any more. Okay, because right now that will be a mud hole in there. We can yeah take take a, a look, take a look yeah. at that because it doesn't. If you continue that line right to Empire. Um, there's no there's no sidewalk, and it's um, there's no paving material in there. So, okay, that was it. Okay, thank you. Just to for the record, this has already been put in, correct? Everything except for the stone diaphragm and. Uh, associated erosion control measures. Okay. All right. Um, was it just an oversight that the applicant yeah. didn't realize that they needed Not to? Not understand that they were over the threshold for the new impervious pavement. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, that, that section that I'm talking about is <coughs> between the sidewalk and Empire. There's, okay. there's dirt in there. In, so within the right of way. Within the right of way, yeah. So they, I just they wanted... require them to get a DOT permit in order to do any of that work. Okay. So I think, you know, that has to be a solid surface. That uh, it would fall completely under the purview of the New York State DOT, and if they would. Okay. It. Right. Okay. So it's something we can suggest but it's really probably up to the applicant if they want to go through the process of going with the DOT to get a permit <coughs> to do that minor work. Yeah, because if you look at elevation... There's something that could be grassy put right. down there or something. Yeah. Because I mean, what's going to happen, cars pull out, it's going to get a, a larger and larger. It's going to be yeah. a... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're happy to work with town staff to... Okay. Find a Jim, solution. You had a question? Yeah, could you point out, please, where the handicap accessible parking stalls are? Um, the handicap accessible uh, is it out in the front, currently. Okay, because they're, the they're not marked. Where's the front? So the there's a the turn around. Yep, handicap right there, okay. right where the curse is at. So you're going to need to show on this plan where the accessible space is and where the loading zone is and where that is striped and also the signage required for the accessible space. We can do that, yep, absolutely. Okay. So you see you've got this area hatched behind the building, but the accessible space needs to be adjacent to the accessible entrance mm -hmm. to the building. Um, yes, the, the hatching in the rear is mainly for, um, to prevent cars from parking in front of that entrance there. Okay. Um, and the accessible parking is out in the front, okay. the accessible route out front. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the board at the, at the moment? All right, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Would anyone in the audience like to comment on this application? Okay, I don't see anybody here. Let me check to see if anybody's called in or submitted electronic submissions. Uh, I see none. Let me just remind people of the phone number. It's 585-340-8771. And if you want to submit electronically, it's penfield.org, and then just click on tonight's, a link to tonight's meeting. Okay, I don't see any other comments. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, you'll Thank be you. hearing from us. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Okay. Item number two. All right, application number two, Passero Associates, 242 West Main Street, Suite 100, Rochester, New York, 14614. On behalf of Eagle Cleaners, requests under Chapter 250, Article 12-12.2 of the Code of the Town of Penfield for preliminary and final site plan approval on the construction of a 5,400 square foot single story building for a dry cleaner with associated site improvements on 0 0.69 acres located at 1698 Penfield Road. The property is now or formerly owned by Ida Schreiner and zoned limited business LB. Application number 22P-0005, SBL 139.05-1-52. Okay, welcome. Good evening, uh, my name is Pat Newcom. I'm with Passero Associates. Uh, we are the civil engineers for the project. Uh, as previously mentioned, our offices are 242 West Main Street in uh, Rochester, New York. Um, also here with me is the applicant, uh, Mike, and I'll let him say his last name because I'll butcher it. So Mike and his wife. So. Good evening, I'm Michael Mitschke, the owner of Eagle Cleaners, and my wife, Darlene Mitschke. And we've been in business, uh, we've had Eagle Cleaners there since 1995 in the plaza. And we're looking forward to moving to 1698 uh, for an expanded operation, for more conveniences to our customers, and additional training for new employees, which we desperately need. Okay. Great. Thanks. So I give a, a little recap of what our plan is. Is there's an existing, approximately two, two or three thousand square foot building there now um, and the intent is to remove that and build a completely new building. Um, the reason being is Mike had, had looked at the existing building to see if it was usable, if it was something that was functional for him and it was not. So he determined that it was better to really just remove the building and reconstruct a new building. Um, so as you can see on our site plan, uh, our intent is to try to keep as much existing pavement as possible um, the location of our new building is really right on top of the existing building location. Um, in addition to some of the improvements we're making to the site, uh, as far as the building goes, we are also gonna bring a dedicated sewer down to the site, um, <coughs> which currently the site is on a uh, septic system. So um, in addition to all of that, we were before the zoning board last month, we received a variance for a front setback because we don't meet the front setback that was granted as well as a uh, sign setback um, for our sign. So both of those variances were granted um, last month with a really positive recommendation for this project. Uh, we've received town comments, we've addressed them. Um, we fully anticipate maybe another round of comments, technical comments from the town uh, town staff, town engineering staff. Um, but other than that, we are here tonight to hopefully obtain preliminary and final approval, site plan approval to move forward with the construction of this project. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, would you like to start off? Yeah, sure. Thank you so Go much on. for for your pr pr presentation. Um, so you had mentioned you have the current location. Now, that is in Panorama Plaza? That's correct. Okay, so 
and you're saying that the space that you have right now isn't sufficient for your business moving forward. Are you seeing a big it's increase in volume? For us, um, but the layout is the biggest issue that we have. And if we were to move to a larger facility inside the plaza, I would still be under the same expenses of moving the equipment and setting up. So and there's where the plaza, where it is in the plaza, what are the uh, stores located on either side of it? Uh, one is Brugger's Bagel Shop and okay. the other is Tuesday Morning. Okay, and there's no room for expanding out that area or anything like that? Okay. And you mentioned training, so you have, you're yeah, going to be training people or? Our facility is uh, only 20 feet wide, so okay. the equipment takes up so much space. Mm -hmm. So with a larger facility, <clears throat> we'd be able to bring in additional pieces of equipment to help train uh, new employees for the future. Okay. So more potential job opportunities? More potential jobs, yes. That's wonderful. I, I noticed that uh, um, I'm not 100% sure if you're tearing down the building, um, why not get rid of some of the existing asphalt? I, I don't understand the, the hesitation in turning some of the existing asphalt into uh, planted green space. Um, so and there's uh, the, uh, as town staff had already mentioned, there are some around Quake Creek watershed um, uh, issues or concerns that come up there um, where anytime you did dig an existing asphalt area or disturb any ground um, it's considered disturbance so our goal is to try to stay away from disturbing as much of what is existing as possible um, to be able to and to utilize what's there rather than replacing it or removing it um, so, so th that's part of the reason behind it is to stay away from having to put a stormwater management facility on a six tenths of an acre site. So is it in the flood plain? It's not in a flood it plain, no. 500 it's just, year? It's, nope, it's not, a, it's not over an acre of disturbance. It just happens to be in Arana Creek watershed, which has a lot more stringent requirements than, than any pro property outside of the Arana Creek watershed. So instead of a, an acre of disturbance, if you disturb less than a half an acre, and there's certain criteria that you have to meet in order to, to end up with um, having to do that. And that's why we're trying to stay away from disturbing more than what we need to. Okay. And the other question I had is about um, uh, running the utilities. Um, I think you're proposing to, to dig up um, Penfield Road. Not the road, there's a green space between, I don't have the, um, I don't actually have an aerial photo to show you, but there's a green space between the edge of the road and there's a sidewalk there that we're proposing to install um, a sanitary sewer. And that comes from right in front of the plaza. She's working on it. Okay. She's a whiz with this stuff. <laughs> yep, so, so there's that, but there's also the green space in front of the plaza, which is where the sanitary sewer will be run. Um, so it won't actually be in the roadway. Okay. Um, other than typical water utility connections, there's no other um, disturbance of the roadway. Okay. Um, are there any elevations of the building that you can um, show? I have everybody? some. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't see him photo bombing the other guy. The other guy's up here, and he's holding the sign up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose. No, I. <laughs> um, I have. I guess I haven't been asleep at this wood yet. <laughs> I have an elevation up. Um, I also have one here. I don't know if you guys can see. Can you see my computer or no? Yeah. Um, yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Displays down yeah. in front of us. Um, so it's the reason why it's not really colored is because it's proposed to be a white building um, with uh, stone, uh, dark stone along the bottom, like a stone uh, veneer. Okay. Um, it's a metal building. There's going to be a portico share that you can drive under to drop your um, laundry off, and someone can come out. It's more like a valet type service. Um, so that's the gist of it. Um, Mike had brought a, a color sample of the stone. Um, 
that he's looking at using for the bottom. So, plain, darker stone uh, with the white building and the gray uh, roof and trim. So it'll be like a standing seam roof or shingle or what kind of? It'd be a metal roof. Metal roof. Metal roof. Yep. In the siding, will it? Is it? Um, can you kind of describe? Will it look? It's a corrugated metal siding, so it'll okay. it'll it'll look similar to a metal building. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board at the moment? No. Nope. Would anyone in the audience like to comment on this application? Anybody out of the millions of people watching in <laughs> cyberspace and on television? Again, phone number 585-340-8771 or penfield.org. The home page, click on the meeting. All right, I don't have uh, anybody on the phone or sending in electronic copies. Thank you for your presentation. Um, we have a little bit more review. Um, I know you asked for approval tonight. It almost, just the way our process works, it almost never happens the same night. Okay. Um, so don't take that as a, hey, what happened? Um, and, uh, so we'll table this this evening and probably discuss it a little bit more at the next work session. Okay. There was no other concerns um, than what you guys have uh, I can't totally say that. Um, okay. This venue is for you to present it to us sure. and give an opportunity for public comment, yeah. um, which obviously, I mean, people can still write in, call in, things like that to the town hall yeah no i was just i was more referring to the board as well so thank you thanks thank you thanks for thank coming thank you all right application number three all right application three dds engineering surveying llp 45 hendricks road west henrietta new york 14586 on behalf of Splash Car Wash Fairport LLC request under Chapter 250, Article 12-12.2 and Article 13-13.2 of the Code of the Town of Penfield for preliminary and final site plan approval and a conditional use permit on building renovations and site improvements of an existing car wash facility under new ownership at, on point z 0 0.96 acres located at 2140 Fairport Nine Mile Point Road. The property is now or formerly owned by Splash Car Wash Fairport LLC and zoned General Business GB. Application number 22P-0006 SBL 140.01-2-5.1. All right. Good evening, Welcome. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thanks for the opportunity uh, for us to present our project tonight. Uh, my name is Cade Krieger with DDS Engineers. Um, also with me here tonight is Garrett Steiner, one of the project engineers at DDS. Jeff Ledoux, the architect on the project, and Jeff Arnold and Dave Clements, both uh, part owners of, of Splash. On behalf of my client, Splash Car Wash, Inc., we're here tonight uh, seeking preliminary and final site plan approval for uh, proposed building renovations and site improvements to an existing car wash facility at 2140 Fairport Nine Mile Point Road. Um, the project consists mainly of site circulation improvements, new pavement, a car wash tunnel extension, um, and a full remodel of the existing building and internal wash components. Existing drainage on the site generally flows from west to east, that'd be from Highway 250 into the site and from south to the north where it uh, historically <coughs> has meandered its way onto the private road and sort of um, found its path to low spots to the east on neighboring properties. 
um, we're proposing new drainage structures to handle the stormwater um, in an effort to improve drainage on the site and provide some water quality uh, treatment as well. In addition, uh, the project will um, involve some new landscaped areas and lighting. Primarily, we'll be relocating light poles and installing uh, new LED lights as the town requires uh, with full cutoff um, as necessary. Ingress to the site will be provided via the existing curb cut onto 250. Um, egress from the site will be onto the private drive to the north. Um, our proposed egress there is approximately 65 feet further to the east, which uh, we feel is a, a big improvement to how the site operates now. It's kind of a, kind of a no man's land of pavement and cars can come and go uh, kind of wherever they please. So I think this will really clean up that area and uh, sort of better meet the goals of the 250 overlay district. Um, there's also an emergency escape lane proposed um, to exit on the property to the east um, for which we will need an access easement um, so that we can tie into a, a proposed access easement that's being granted to the town on that property. That escape lane is kind of a last ditch. If someone needs to get out, they can get out. Most of the time it'll be coned off. It is not a place where cars can uh, turn off um, you know, normally if they want to. So one of the uh, staff is gonna have to pull the cones and let them out. So it's not gonna be a heavily traversed um, uh, egress from the site. Um, the facility will utilize existing water and sanitary services. We're not proposing any changes to those services. Uh, we feel they're adequate for the car wash as it operates now. Um, we will be attending the ZBA uh, meeting this month to ask for an area variance uh, for front setback to allow for a 20-foot extension of the existing building to the west um, in order to prov provide the minimum desired tunnel length for uh, the, sp the car wash operations that they need. Um, we feel that that uh, encroachment into the front setback is in line with surrounding businesses as many of the businesses along that stretch are in fact closer to the right away than the um, existing car wash out there. Um, we will also need a New York State DOT highway work permit uh, to do the work outside of our property line um, in the right away, DOT right away. <coughs> We're not Hopefully, we're going to avoid um, changing that curb cut at all. We want to utilize that existing curb cut, but we are um, changing the alignment of that pavement a little bit. Um, a couple things. Uh, you know, we've presented the project at the PRC meeting once in November and then again yesterday and got some good feedback from town staff. And there was a few things we discussed that I wanted to bring to the board tonight as well. Um, there isn't any pre-wash going on at these um, state-of-the-art um, car washes that Splash is building, uh, meaning there's no one out there standing in the front hosing off cars where drainage is coming back from the front. Um, they're, they're installing internal um, high-pressure wash systems that are... Um, you know, they do a better job than any pre-wash is gonna do. So that that's not something we have to worry about necessarily. <clears throat> um, and then I know sound uh, is gonna come up as a question. So the way these vac spaces work, all those internal parking spaces are vacuum spaces. The way those work is there's a, a like a 75 horsepower vac motor on for each row that have silencers on them. They're extremely quiet compared to conventional vac systems where the sound is coming out of the vac hose itself. With these, um, the, the motor itself ramps up as people use it and it shuts off if there's no one using uh, the facilities. Um, in it, we, we have sound decibel data that we'll provide to town staff. Um, and I believe it's in the range of 38 decibels, 30 feet out. So it's 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 very minimal. Um, 
some of the other items we discussed at the PRC meeting are uh, they'd like to see us square up that entrance coming in a little bit more with 250, which I agree with. Um, we're gonna try to soften that angle as best we can. Hopefully we don't have to lose a vac space, but um, if we have to, uh, we'll make it work. Uh, we did run some uh, turning movements with a large truck and have 450 crew cab, about the biggest truck I could find on there. It, had, it really had no problem making that inside turn uh, from 250 on the inside lane into the site. Um, so we'll, we'll provide that to town staff as well. Um, we also talked about the accessible parking spot um, being a little unclear of where uh, you were to offload or load or offload if needed. We're gonna just stripe off that entire spot so that if there's someone with a van that you know needs to load or offload, they can uh, park to one side or the other in order to do that because there's ample space. That's a 16 foot wide space, so they should have enough space to do that per the ADA uh, requirements. And then on this plan, you'll see initially we had a traffic <coughs> pattern reversed uh, coming out of the tunnel. And that was in an effort to allow uh, cars that are coming out of the wash to get into the vac spots um, un unobstructed. We realize that that's a little confusing and we're, we're rethinking that now. So we're gonna put that back to the normal traffic pattern, uh, right, right in, right out. And we'll just put a stop bar on the lane coming out of the vac spots so that the tunnel has the right of way coming into the vacuum areas and then anyone leaving has to wait. In addition, um, there's gonna be traffic loops in there, emergency stop loops where if someone at the end of the tunnel has to stop for any reason, the tunnel operation stops. It senses that stops, it won't create a backup of cars. Um, we talked about photometrics for the site. We, cur we don't have them currently on this, uh, in this set. We'll, we'll be providing those. Um, like I said, it's gonna be relocation of pole bases, but um, probably proposing new poles. So we'll get those to town staff before the next meeting. And then we, we talked about the tower, which is proposed on the architectural renderings. And that there's really no, um, there's no offices up there or anything. It's not really a, a practical um, function. It's more of an architectural character um, for the building um, that a lot of their um, new sites are implementing. And I think uh, most of you should have pictures um, from some of the sites. Um, Geneva and Newark are good examples of new sites that have towers. Um, that's all I have, so I'll turn it over to the board at this time uh, for any questions. Okay, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I have a few, uh, a few questions. Um, the, you finished up with the tower, I guess I'll start with the tower. Mm -hmm. um, this, I'm assuming, is this the Geneva location? Yes, that's correct. And the the part of the structure that I guess you call, we call the tower in the Penfield proposal is significantly taller than this, right? Or is it the same? It, it'll Does be it just this, look different. Yeah, in yeah the it'll be rendering? the same or similar. Yep. Yeah, it just looks. They're similar in height between the two. I think part of it is because this one is not as rectangular as that one, so it, it makes it look. So it looks a lot more massive you know what the in that, that rendering one? than. That one's 34 feet. Yeah, and I think Geneva's 35, 34 and a half, so. I believe Geneva's 30, just over, just under 35 feet, so I can verify that. Okay, so they're essentially, they're they're essentially the and same, we surely, like within a half a foot or something? And we yes. surely would have no problem dropping that down, sir. Okay. And it's, but I think it's shown. I don't know the elevation, the tower height, but it's, we set the tower height at just under, it was either right at the, the bottom right there, yeah. 
It's 32 feet. And I'm assuming that's mostly a branding yes. feature. Correct that. Yeah, so, yeah, so this one is shorter than the one that, that, you, want, that you were just showing. So I stopped by the Geneva location yesterday and um, I wasn't 100% sure. You know, I came down south on Preemption Road, made a right, an immediate right into the parking lot because I wanted to check it out. And all of a sudden I see myself swearing at myself saying, how do I get out of here? I don't, I don't wanna get the car washed. Um, I'm sort of stuck. I have no, I'm, I'm trapped. Like you, 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 I pulled in and all of a sudden Can I I'm like, then nowhere to go other than through the pay booths, through the car wash, and then get out. Thankfully, there weren't. It wasn't stacked up. It was, you know, the weather wasn't great, so there wasn't a million cars there. There wasn't anybody else there, and so I, I just did a K turn and <laughs> went out the entrance. Um, but it struck me that that can happen with people uh, on a fairly regular basis, even if they, hey, just I just want to turn around. I made a, a wrong turn. I need to turn around and go back somewhere else, and they're going to find themselves. This site plan has the exact same scenario where you pull in, and there is no way to get out without paying for and going through the car wash. Uh, and I, that can I is something that I really strongly suggest maybe there's an alternative way to do that and go so ahead and our, our sites are these washes are staffed fully when we're open for operation the, you do not have to go through that pay you, you have to go through the pay station you don't have to pay there's an attendant there that's always going to be available to open they simply would flip a button from inside the office or at the pay booth our tenants will open the gate to allow you to go through the escape exit and back out and around it's, it's really just that simple. There's no complication. We don't question customers why. We're, there's, we're not trying to sell them if they came in, didn't want to wash. We, the, the gates, again, the office, the manager who's inside the office can see it. He can open the gate, any one of the three gates, whichever one you're coming up to, or the attendant right there at the site can walk over to the back side of the gate, hits a button, the gate goes up, and then there's an entire escape route. There's always an escape lane to get somebody out of there. So, so if uh, in the scenario that it's a busy day and there's cars queued up, yep. let's say in this, in this facility, um, you're heading north and I think Burger King's right to the south, correct? Mm -hmm. yep. So you go past Burger King. Geez, I missed the entrance to Burger King. I really wanted to do that, but this is busy. I make a right turn into this and realize I made a mistake. I can't get into Burger King. And now there's how many cars can stack up there? Probably, Probably 30. 30. So I'm waiting for 30 <clears throat> cars to go through before I can say, hey, uh, I didn't mean to do this. I just wanted a whopper, um, and then they let you out the escape hatch. Correct. The, if we if we connected the entry into the vacuum center, which we clearly could, right, right as you come in, 20 feet in, we could connect it. The, the issue we're going to get into is a problem. What we have is we'll have 60 percent of the people using the vacuums will be non-paying customers. We, we provide a, a very expensive free service. It's, you know, it's probably a $300,000 vacuum center for free, for free to all the car wash customers. Mm -hmm. It's a service provided. In our Seneca Falls application where we have it's a free for all where anybody can come and go without having to get a wash, I would say probably in that application it's probably 60, 70 percent of the customers using the vacuums don't wash, don't pay, don't spend a nickel with us. It's a, it's a costly thing. If you, if you allow that access to that vacuum center at no charge, you just get, um, I don't want to say taken advantage of it. That's not what I mean, because I'm sure a lot of those people come back at another time and may wash their car or not. So they may be customers. But any customer of ours can come through with an unlimited plast. Even if they want to wash, they can be fed into the vacuum cleaner by vacuum system. But um, 
we don't we don't have the way to control it if we allow an access point just into the vacuum center from that area. Um, I guess we could double gate it so when they came in and out of the vacuums, the sensors would go off to open the gates to, to have them go in. That's, as you can see, Geneva, the gates aren't fully up yet. There's, we just got that site open on Friday afternoon. It's not completely finished yet. So how many sites do you have that have been in operation with this type of traffic flow and what, so I don't, I'm telling you my initial reaction as a normal human being, right. pulling in and then freaking out. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm, hey, it's my way or the high, I'm open-minded <laughs> toward right. this, but I do want to be convinced that it, it's a sensible, alternative and, and if you have data or something that hey you know what we've been doing it this way for 10 years and you know in, in places where they've been in operation on busy roads and so forth I can count on one hand or this is the number of times that we've had an issue. Our, our Terrytown location or uh, not Terrytown our um, downstate location washes probably three times as many as this site will ever wash. And they've had this in, ongoing for many years, this, this same type of setup. Um, so you go in, there's really no, you know, you have to kind of Correct, and, and, and I can get you the facts on all the splash locations. There's, there's in the neighborhood of 40 some splash locations now. We as Classy Chassis joined the splash group uh, back at the end of October, so I can't give you the, all the, the exact data on all the ones that they have in this and this nature, but this is the way that every site of Splash is designed, and and not only Splash, it's pretty much an industry standard now. It's a it's pretty much the way they're being built throughout the United States. I don't see any other designs really much anymore down south, Texas, Florida, Carolinas. I mean, this is a, the typical layouts everybody's going with to try to control that vacuum center as, as much as anything. And again, if you create escape routes, we have a system in Williamsville, our new site that we built a year ago. Uh, it has that access to get through it. And if you went there and you saw that, it would be even more appalling because everybody cuts the corner. They shoot through Mach 1 right through the whole car wash to get to the next road over because they, they see the way to avoid a, a traffic light, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that situation is, is not a good situation at all either. I mean, I think far, far, far more dangerous than what we have here. And again, once this site's closed, when it goes dark at night, that entire front lane is, is coned off. All the accidental lanes are coned off, so nobody can pull into the site. Okay, so you mentioned that most of the new designs and things for car washes are of this, in this manner. Most of the express car washes of this nature have, have kind of all started to gear towards this concept, yes. How long ago did they start doing that, and how has that played out? I mean, I'm wondering, you know, with the vacuum, I get the fact that, hey, I spent $300,000 on these vacuums, and I don't need a bunch of freeloaders just coming in and using the vacuum um, without paying for a car wash. I, I, I do get that. I'm a right. capitalist. <laughs> um, but couldn't you get a code or something as you go and you pay for the car wash and you say, hey, punch in, you know, 11000 and you can get a free vacuum at the end? So if you see on, there's a, what's called the central vac, our unit that, that uh, Kate had talked about. These run on a, on a high horsepower turbine vac. There is Jeff Ledoux, who came to the Geneva site today, he's our architect on this project, and he's never been to an advanced site like that. I mean, we were standing, what, 15 feet from the vacuum and was just blown away, There's, it's silent. Where the typical canister vacs where you could put, each canister vac has its own motor that drives it, the, they don't, there's no way to silence those, they can't silence them. With, so each time you would fire up those loud motors, the noise disturbance would be again, outweigh that benefit. So we prefer to go with the state-of-the-art Vacutech system with this turbine silence motor system, which drives every single uh, every single nozzle. So uh, 
and again, so you can't turn them off independently, essentially. Yeah, they, there's a, a, a there's an in concrete sort of sensor that senses when a car enters the vacuum system, turns it on, and according to how many nozzles come off, it'll ramp up and down, you know, to save on energy. But again, we could surely put an exit in right off the right at the entrance would be the easiest way to connect where the uh, the drive line comes in. Is we could add something there and and the we would live with it. I mean, it's not it's not a game enter. Yeah, I should say we all, we also contemplated doing that, but making it not such an obvious uh, mm -hmm. travel way. So it would have a mountable curb with maybe a raised section and a hard surface like uh, pavers or stone where you could drive over it, but it's not clearly a, a, lane, come on through. a yeah. lane for, yeah, coming on in. So no arrows, you know, pointing to the vacuums or anything like that. Okay. All right. Um, couple questions about the, the entry you, you sort of answered them. Is the reason that there's a pole there, is that why it's so far north? Or can the entire entrance be shifted south a little bit? Yeah, there's a, there's a pole there, yep, that we don't wanna um, mess with. We don't wanna with. have to move the pole. And also we'd rather not mess with the existing curb cut. I mean, it's just easier from a, a construction and permitting standpoint to utilize what's there that's kind of what's driving the entrance point and angle. Um, otherwise, um, coming out perpendicular, um, still avoiding that pole, that's a whole new uh, uh, DOT permit. Okay. And then you mentioned that you have reconfigured the, um, that when you leave the wash and go over to the to the vacuums that uh, you abandon the British and Hong Kong traffic yes. flow to that's right. go that's right. with the As of yesterday American morning, we, we abandoned that idea, yes. So uh, the people leaving the tunnel will now come around the outside on okay. the right side. And then the people on the inside leaving the vacs, there'll be a stop bar there, so they have to wait. Basically. Okay, so kind of an alternate traffic type yeah. thing. Yep. Okay. I those are the questions I have at the moment. Uh, who wants to go first? Kelly? I will. So on this here, it, there's a mat room. Is that something that will be at this location and what it what is it specifically? Yeah, I don't I, I don't believe we were able to fit a mat room in here. Our architect wasn't able to do that for us. So. Okay. <laughs> um, what the mat room is, is it's kind of another new concept that we're at, at into as many washes as we can possibly, but um, limited on, si on space here. But it's for a customer to be able to walk in, they drop their mats on a machine and it cleans it, no charge, just cleans all their, their mats. It takes about a minute for, to put four mats through it. Okay. So, do you have, so. Jeff couldn't do that, huh? <laughs> I thought he was a good architect, and he so couldn't figure out a place to put him. Oh, yeah, the mat room. <laughs> With other car washes, they have, you know, members only things that you stick in your windshield, and you go right, zip right on through, and don't have to wait in line. Is there going to be something similar? Yeah, we're going to do even better than that. So we, we go to all LPRs, license plate recognitions, so there's no tags anymore, nothing in front of your windshield, just picks up your, your license plate, and off you go through. Oh. So Geneva has is the first LPR system that I know of around here. And what's the monthly cost for that membership? Uh, I think our, our monthly started at 1999, 1995. Okay. okay, and unlimited, you can go unlimited. through as many yep. times as you want? Yep. correct. Five times a day if you want to? Yes, and probably one of the lanes, one of the three lanes will be an express lane exclusively for, for members to go right through. So. Okay. My last question, um, I was a bit confused when you were mentioning the cones. What exactly, so you're going to, I'm just envisioning the car wash shutting down for the night and you're just putting construction cones out. Is that, is that what it is or can you elaborate uh, a little bit with so, that? Yeah, on the escape lane, that would be sort of coned off all the time. The, you know, the smaller cones you, you see sometimes at um, these facilities so that it's not an exit point for people to just get through the site like we were talking about. Um, if they want to use that, they would be at the kiosk, they would notify 
one of the staff, the staff would let them through. The staff would go over, pull the cones, let them out, put the cones back. In an ideal world, staff would do that, but I yep. see, you know, people possibly doing that themselves. They do. Yeah, we have <laughs> we we use uh, blue cones. Uh, we don't use orange cones on any of our sites. For, they're a blue cone to color match, and we simply do the best we can with it. But what happens at the escape lane area is just simply if a customer, they, these escape lanes get used if once a day would be a lot. Um, okay. It would be simply somebody come on, let's say a big mutter truck that's eight feet tall in the air, and, and our limit is seven foot four. Um, they got through, they ignored the signs at the pay station, got through. Our staff would then explain to them, refund them their money, and exit them out the, the escape lane. So, um, or somebody came through, they didn't realize it was a, a friction type wash, they wanted touchless, you know, maybe a situation like that, um, or any other reason to, to, to exit them. And as far as at nighttime, we just simply cone off the, the entrance to the wash to prevent people coming on and driving around. The vacuums, everything, when, when we shut off and we close, it goes pretty much dark. I mean, there's building safety lights and so forth, but the, uh, the business is shut down, so we prefer not to have customers just driving around inside there. So we just put typically three cones up at the exit entrance. If they get on and move them, um, there's plenty of security cameras on these sites, so. Sure. And what are the hours of operation? Uh, the hours of operation here, I believe, will be seven. Um, do you remember what they were, Kate? Were it seven to it's nine? Seven to nine is what we would okay. propose. And yeah. that's probably the maximum. They typically we start off at seven. You know, we may look at that, but most of them really are going like eight to seven, eight to eight. But it's really rare that we have many customers come in much after six, seven at night. It's just not cost prohibitive to keep open for one or two cars that might come in from eight to nine, or sometimes even seven to eight in the winter time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob. I had back on the <clears throat> talking about the tower. Is is that purely and maybe I missed it, an architectural element, or is there there's any a, equipment to some distance up? There, there's two things we do need height for. Is the we can get a little a better vacuum si or dryer system uh, the cars. Uh, with a little bit more space above the ceilings when we get to that like 13, 14 foot of clearance, it improves our ability uh, for our, our dryers to work better. And then on top of that, we we need a, the majority of the heat that we need in these uh, washes that at the, is at the exit and the entrance, but majority at the, the exit. So we'll have a minimum of two furnaces up there um, that'll create the heat that'll go down through the tunnel and the furnaces actually go up in this tower, they're not visible from the windows or below the windows. We use a, a floor mounted system. So, and again, we could do it less. It's not, it's more of a okay. feature to try to catch somebody's eye and, and it looks better than just to us, just a, a basic blah type of, uh, we're trying to create a look with a, with a silver aluminum halo up and on all our sites now. Okay, so the, the equipment doesn't utilize all of that space, but consumes no, some of it. Yes, sir. Yeah. And again, we try to stay with, with all our vacuums, we stay away from the, the industry standard is, is, is bright red, bright blue, or bright yellow vacuums with all the stanchions. And we've gone to silver to try to tie it into the gray of the buildings and be a more com a calm look with the stanchions. Um, I think you probably saw how many we had in Geneva yesterday. That building, the way it presented itself, it may not have been ideal to everybody, but we try to We've tried to tune all ours down with using the silver, a silver gray color on the stanchion, as opposed to the bright yellows and blues and reds you see on typical ones. Okay, thank you. One other thing that, while I was out there, I, I ended up going across the street, sitting in the parking lot of the, whatever building is across Route 20. The, the uh, cobblestone? Yeah. The restaurant? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, it does, doesn't matter. But um, looking north and watching what was happening, somebody pulled in to pick up somebody that was working there. And they pulled in the exit and then parked in one of the vacuum spots. I initially thought that they were one of those freeloaders that you want to pick up from vacuuming for free. But then I saw a worker come out and get in the car and, and go. So. We have a relationship in this situation. We have a relationship with the next door neighbor. 
um, for employee parking um, forevermore. So that situation actually has two gates that go on the exit, so to prevent customer, customers from coming in the wrong way. Um, the, the gate controller sensors are on back order, so the gates weren't on. Otherwise, that customer would not have been able to pull backwards in. They would have had to go to the employee the parking entry. area. So let's say my 16-year-old well, kid gets a job at the car wash, doesn't have the driver's license, I need to drop them off for work and pick them up from work. Where do I Kate, go do that if there's a gate? Yeah, so Can we uh, bring that up on the picture. It's, it shows clearly the employee parking staff here. Yeah, so you could potentially just pull into one of those spots, drop them off, and then So the then gate that you're talking about, would that be then somewhere on that single drive aisle? Yeah. Around the, the north yep. that heads east? Yep, it would be prior to the dumpster uh, enclosure coming straight in, so it would be somewhere on that single drive aisle. Okay. <coughs> you know, these, these gates have come a long way from the gates that we first started using 10 years ago. They're really pretty pretty foolproof, okay. especially when the company sends the sensors out in time. But Geneva, you, it would have, there's two, I don't know if you saw it, the exit side, there was, there's two uh, monuments there, they're electron, they're, that hold the gates. The gates just, we've taken them down because the, the sensors that, uh, one of the components of it never got sent out by the company, they're on back order. So. But again, in this situation, there's going to be plenty of space to pull in where the employee parking is to pick up. Do you have any landscaping proposed for, say, uh, to the east? Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, proposed landscaping. Yeah, uh, so that green space up kind of on the northeast corner, I think we we definitely should add some there. Um, we're kind of, we're trying to earmark an area for a bioretention facility, which uh, we're working on with town staff. I haven't uh, nailed down that location uh, quite yet. It's probably going to be to, nor to, to the north of the building there, um, in between the building and the, the exit lane out. There's a big utility pole there with transformers on it that we need to avoid. So that's that's really the only area where we can fit green infrastructure. So once I develop that uh, a little further, um, we'll add plantings in for that, and I'll I'll make sure we beef up the plantings um, on that northeast corner. And then I know there was a note in the PRC t uh, comments as well that that grass strip between the VAC uh, parking field and the entrance aisle. Um, we call that out as landscaped. We're just not showing any shrub blocks there. We'll get those in there and make sure we clarify that. Okay. But there's no screening to the east at all proposed. Yeah, I mean, we have pavement r right up to the line pretty much there. Um, in order to make the uh, operations work. Um, we could potentially do uh, like a, a decorative wall or decorative fence or something like that, but even that I think is gonna be tight. Okay. And there, I, I know there's a, between that and the property to the east there, there's a access road that's recently been built. Um, so, <coughs> Maybe there's an opportunity to do something mutually in that area between the property line and the access road because it, it's really not uh, going to be used for much else. Okay. Jim, do you have any questions? Yeah, I actually have a question for Mike. Is, is <laughs> this oh, give spot. us an opportunity to uh, get a, uh, a maintenance agreement in place for the service road to the north of this? property that's been perpetually full of potholes? Uh, yeah, we're, well, I'm not, I don't know if this site will be able to, but <clears throat> we've gotten, um, I think the next future application we'll be able to do that, because currently I believe the town plows that access road, 
and their current owner is sort of responsible for the maintenance of it, but obviously they haven't been too quick on providing that maintenance, so uh, I think that in the future we'll be able to do something with that. But unfortunately with this applicant, it's different property, so. Yeah, I posed this question a couple of years ago, and uh, um, they seem to do a pretty good job in the immediate vicinity of the bank and the back outlet to McDonald's, um, but the rest of that road is just, it's, it's a mess. And, yeah. you know, with what they're doing here in particular with this new service road and this large uh, exit to the north, mm -hmm. um, more people are going to be inclined to pull yeah. out and perhaps take a right, take, take a right, to, uh, so that east they can shoot for to uh, Eastern Penfield. Right, yep. and uh, you know, my my understanding was that the uh, owners of all of that property and and that's that service access roadway um, kind of got in before the town initiated that requirement for a maintenance agreement, and and uh, the town was somewhat powerless to. Right. To do anything. So, you know, I, to me, that's an important element for this application and the other applications that I know are coming down the road. Right. And that's probably going to be when our opportunity to get that property maintenance agreement with that. So you oh. have, when you have tenants like this, um, you know, they can perhaps uh, bring some pressure to bear <laughs> on the property owner. Yeah. Um, we'll require them to provide a property maintenance agreement as well. So I, I'm i not sure if there's one on their existing, but since it's new ownership, they're, we'll, have to, I, they're probably we'll probably have to ask for one. We'll have to investigate that. Yeah. Okay. What is the green space percentage? Um, it's approximately... 36 percent it's okay, about 64 so percent impervious <coughs> right now so it's right under the threshold of okay. what's allowed yep. <clears throat> okay so I also wanted to ask you um, if you uh, uh, were prepared to provide a written response to the um, Penfield Review Committee's comments that were sent out uh, yes last we, week yep we will get those to you um, next Friday I believe is the deadline prior to the the following work, work session. session meeting yep okay any other questions from the board at the moment okay I'd like to open it up for uh, anyone in the audience that would care to comment on this application we also as a reminder to all of those watching from home uh, 585-340-8771 or penfield.org and you can click on the, the link to this meeting and send your comments in electronically. I do not see anybody here in the audience that uh, would like to comment or on the phone or electronically. So thank you um, for your presentation. We will be sending out a tabling resolution with comments and probably asking for some additional info. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank All right. Application number four, BME Associates, 10 Lift Bridge Lane East, Fairport, New York, 14450. 
on behalf of Luis Ribeiro, request under Chapter 250, Article 12-12.2 of the Code of the Town of Penfield for preliminary and final site plan approval for proposed mixed-use building on Lot 3 of the Penfield, Penfield Square development. The proposed building will include a mix of eight residential apartment units and 5,680 square feet of commercial tenant space and associated site improvements on 0 .40 acres located at 300 YMCA Way. The property is now or formerly owned by Penfield Square 3 LLC and zoned mixed use development MUD. Application number 22P-0007 SBL 125.01-1-25.33. Mike, it's all you. <laughs> Evening. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, last but not least, I'm Mike Bogajewski with BME Associates um, on behalf of applicant Louis Ribeiro and then also with me is Eric Reynolds from SWBR, the architects. Um, hopefully I got my laptop plugged in here so you can see my screen. You must have a really old computer. We'll have to talk to Pete Vars about getting you a new one. No, they just got me this one. earlier. <laughs> I can hand off controls if it's easiest. <laughs> uh, we can be a little patient. All right. I do want to hear, I mean, this, this is important to us to give you guys the ability to run your own presentation, sure, sure. get your own flow going. And not that Catherine doesn't do a great job, but Um, yeah, I was excited to try it. The, uh, the, um, the, I do have one question though, since it's two applications for lot three and lot four, do you want me to kind of cover them simultaneously or do you want me to keep it separate lot three and then go through lot four? Um, I would prefer they go together. Did you read both or I did, did not you read both? Okay, legals. why don't you, while, while Brian's well. working on getting that together. You okay with that, Peter? I don't see an issue with that, but I'm not a lawyer, so. Is I think it's okay. I mean, they're they're. It's both the same, isn't it? The same applicant for both. Yes. Same applicant. Yes. We can, I think we can discuss them simultaneously. I, yes. I understand that there's two separate applications. Okay, so why don't you read the uh, okay. the announcement for. The other one and all right so in addition to application four application five bme associates 10 left bridge lane east fairport new york 14450 on behalf of lewis or bureau requests under chapter 250 article 12-12.2 of the code of the town of penfield for preliminary and final site plan approval for proposed mixed use building on lot four of the penfield square development the proposed building will include a mix of six residential apartment units and 4740 square feet of commercial tenant space and associated site improvements on 0.34 acres located at 100 YMCA Way. The property is now or formerly owned by Penfield Square 4 LLC and zoned mixed use development MUD. Application number 22P-0008 SBL 125.01-1-25.34. Off you go. Excellent. <laughs> Doug did a very good job. Um, so we're here tonight to request site plan approval for both of these lots, lot three and lot four. Um, they were created with the overall Penfield Square development 
um, has two out parcel lots to be developed later on. Um, both buildings are similar with that they're both proposing first floor commercial tenant space with second and third floors of residential apartments. Um, we did reach out to the town previously to get a determination from town building department and code enforcement officer and town attorney um, that when figuring out the density for this development that each of these lots would be considered individual when considering the residential density along with the, the commercial space. Um, so lot three itself is the, I'm gonna call it the western most lot. If you're looking, if you're standing at 250, it's we've been calling it the rear building. Um, and that's that this building, the, um, the mm -hmm. more square building central to the Penfield Square development. Um, <clears throat> Like I mentioned, it's three stories, and Doug did mention the the um, 4,400 plus or minus commercial space on the first floor with eight apartment units on the um, second and third floor, which would be a mixture of um, one bedroom and two bedroom units. The building them itself, um, has been designed to integrate with the with the overall site plan. Like I had mentioned, a lot of the infrastructure was previously put in with the, the overall Penfield Square development. Um, there isn't a whole lot of site plan improvements um, that would need to be constructed around this building. Um, just mainly the, the building itself along with some, some foundation plantings and the sidewalk connections. Uh, similarly, lot four, which is the one closer to the the YMCA way entrance onto 250, basically at the, the corner of 250 and YMCA way there. Um, similarly, first floor commercial um, <clears throat> with second and third story apartment units. Um, lot four would have a total of six apartment units and um, hopefully Eric, when he talks about the building architecture, can, can explain how the buildings work internally with the, the commercial space and the apartment units also. Um, the, and like I said, similarly with lot three, lot four, not much uh, site plan improvements. A lot of it was previously constructed um, with the overall Penfield Square development. The Utilities basically are connections to existing existing mains that have been previously installed. Um, parking has been previously constructed. Uh, there are currently 220 spaces um, throughout the overall Penfield Square development with shared parking agreements between all of the lots. Um, and we did outline um, on the site plans, the required and, and provided parking calcs for these two buildings. Um, lot three and lot four both have some parking spaces that fall on the lot itself, but like I said, the parking basically is an overall shared parking throughout the entire development. Um, if you look at the breakdown between the existing buildings and the new proposed apart residential apartments, um, that totals, um, where did it go here? I think approximately 140 spaces would be required um, between the existing Penfield Square buildings plus the new, uh, the new residential apartments. Um, that leaves 79 spaces for the commercial uses for basically an extra parking beyond that. We are eliminating one spot because we're adding a new accessible space at lot four. So one spot gets striped. So 
the overall 220 spaces that are existing drops down to 219. So you end up with the 79 spaces left over. Um, since there is some commercial um, tenant space available on the first floors, there will be some future signage, but that will be a separate sign application. Um, they'll be submitted later once they're, um, once tenants are identified. Tenants, I don't believe, are identified currently. Um, Lewis is basically wanting to build the commercial space to make it available for, for future tenants. Um, we did provide the building architecture. I think Eric can kind of go through a little bit of the, the building architecture and then um, then we can open it up for any, any questions and further discussion. Okay. Thanks. One thing, just to be clear, I don't think you mentioned it, Mike, the one slight improvement that is at parcel three, the rear building there, is we are doing a continuation of the pedestrian spine. There is sort of a dedicated section that's quote unquote public, but directly in front of our building, we're doing a continuation of what's already there. So I just wanted to mention that that was included in the site plans, um, but that's really the only major site improvement that's happening is just continuing that um, pedestrian spine in front of lot three. So as far as the architecture is concerned, as Mike said, it's three stories. Um, I think most of the folks here, well, at least I remember doing the original Penfield Square application. This rear building is very similar to the architecture that we presented a couple of years ago for that. But generally speaking, um, we're trying to fit in with the mixed use development guidelines. So you'll see that the ground floor elevation has a lot of pedestrian scale elements, large glass windows, um, things like canopies and awnings that would um, signify a mixed use building. And then the upper floors are sort of traditional apartment style, so there's balconies, um, windows, and both of the <coughs> main elements on the front piece are um, f capped off with cornice elements to continue sort of the look from the other Penfield Square buildings. As far as the materiality goes, the main piece on the corner is a composite wood siding. It's the same siding that is being used at the bridge of Penfield Square that connects the two buildings. Um, so it's a light colored wood. The other materials are a brick veneer at the ground floor to ground the building. Again, more use, more uh, in line with the mixed use. That'll be complementary to the colors that are already there. And then the upper floor, residential floors above the brick veneer are again, two more complementary colors and materials from the rest of the project. So there's horizontal white siding and a gray panel siding. Um, other than that, I think the, if we move over to the front building, this one has changed a little bit more from the original application a couple years ago, um, but we're trying to keep in, in mind what we had shown at that point and work, with, work within that kit of parts, so to speak. So again, same types of things, the ground floor trying to stick with a mixed use look. So there's sort of a layered section there, um, large storefront glazing for the commercial uses, pedestrian scale elements again, sconces, lighting, um, canopies, things of that nature. And then the upper floors again, balconies and uh, residential style windows. As far as the materials go for this building, we have a manufactured stone veneer, which would be in the same, uh, which would be the same manufactured stone veneer that's on the Penfield Square buildings. And then we would be proposing two different types of siding, a vertical board and batten style siding and a horizontal siding. And then this building here, um, just given its scale, has a pitched roof on it, again, keeping in kind with the original sort of proposal and then some timber elements that frame the roof elements at the top as well as the balcony elements. Um, if just talk for a quick second on the way the buildings function, there is small sections on the ground floor that are residential lobbies. So you come in at the ground floor, there's a small section there for, with vertical circulation to get up to the apartments. Uh, the rear building has what I would call corridor style apartments. So there's eight corridor style apartments and the front building has townhouse style apartments. So you go up 
your living space is on one floor and the sleeping space is on the other floor. So in the rear building, eight apartment style units. In the front building, we have six townhouse style units. That's why you don't see the exact same language carried from second floor to third floor. Um, overall, like I said, we're trying to keep within the mixed use development guidelines, provide elements to the building architecture that are in line with that. And um, you would expect to see for a building with ground floor commercial space and upper floor residential space. Uh, other than that, if there's any questions from the board? Okay. So let's talk for a minute about the overall Penfield Square success to date. What's the absorption rate on the dwelling units? That is a great question. I uh, work with home leasing all the time, and every one of their apartments sells out or every one of their projects sells out. They have a, a great provider. Um, I don't know anything else other than that. I don't know for sure on that. Um, and then the assisted living building, I imagine is also doing very well, but that's sort of different. That's, you're not that's like a, renting a, that out. It's not a sort of a, it's a little bit different of a model there, but yeah. I imagine that that is also doing well. But What about the uh, commercial space? How are you doing with leasing the commercial space? I don't know that there's any true commercial space that's for rent that already that wasn't part of the original project. Non-residential space. Yeah, so the most of the non-residential space in that project was part of the assisted living building and it's that ground floor along the pedestrian spine. There's dining rooms and bistros that are along there and as far as I know they're functioning and you have any exist. uh prospective tenants for the commercial spaces that you're proposing here? I'll turn it over to Lewis, but I think... We do not. No, not at this time. So we haven't really started to market it yet until we had our approvals. So once we have the approvals, then we'll start the marketing process. Microphone, on please. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So it, until we get our approval, we haven't done any marketing studies or put it out to market yet. Okay. So no, no perspectives right now. Um, have you done a study of... Can I interject here? Sure, go quick? ahead. What types of commercial establishments will you be targeting? So would Do like you have to... an idea of what you want to see in there? Yeah, so no, I mean, I don't think we'll have full service restaurants, nothing along those lines. Uh, potentially a cafe, something like that, something that would cater to the tenants as well as the home leasing project. It could be medical, something that relates to the YMCA, physical therapists, doctors, something like that. But no set preference at this point. Okay. Go ahead, Jim. Okay. Um, have you done a study to check these two applications against the consistency with the application that we based the overall Penfield Square approval resolution on? And the, the other part of that is, have you taken the time to go through the approval resolution to see whether or not these two projects as part of the overall mixed use development are consistent with the conditions of approval in the approval resolution? Um, I know they're consistent with what was originally proposed on the overall Penfield Square plans. Um, the original Penfield Square plans did show the two out parcel buildings didn't have the residential uses on the second and third floor that wasn't originally proposed, um, which is why we had reached out to the town to get the, the determination on how to um, handle the, the density of the overall Penfield Square development versus the residential density on each of these two lots. And that was an addition to the original Penfield Square approvals. Um, I know we looked at it, but I don't know if there's anything specific that's different from the original Penfield Square approval conditions. Um, so I think it's I think it's worth doing that study and presenting that to the town. Sure. Um, 
because that's one of the things that we're charged with is not just looking at these two applications, sure. but the big picture and seeing whether or not anything that you're proposing um, deviates from what was presented yep. uh, and or what the conditions for approval were. Yeah, we, I, be, I mean, as part of our, I'm gonna say our responses to, I know we've received PRC comments so far. We're here tonight to get any comments from the planning board so that way we could provide responses to all those. One of those responses we could um, provide is some additional input on how these two two lots um, compare to the original Penfield Square approval conditions. Okay. The intent is to remain consistent <laughs> with what was originally proposed, um, like I said, with the addition of That's the- good. That's good. That's our intent too. <laughs> yep. So another question for the developer. What kind of housing are, are you proposing here? It's gonna be luxury market rate apartments. Luxury market yeah. rate. Absolutely. Okay. Um, what are we doing with, uh, with uh, waste hauling and uh, uh, waste disposal in these two buildings? That's something I think that as we are finalizing the, the site plans and the architectural plans that we'll look to confirm, um, currently, I think it's going to be internal um, trash bins for lot four and possibly a, a trash bin corral somewhere around lot three building that um, could store some of the, the trash bins. Um, that's the intent, but I know that we're going to, that was one of the PRC comments that we received that we'd like to, to look at confirming and then provide. So you're talking about wheeled totes, is that what you're wheeled thinking? Wheeled totes, yep. Yeah, so, so specifically for the apartments. So like Mike said, the, the parcel three with the rear building, there's an area for a trash corral there, sort of in the back side of the site. That's a no brainer. The front building will have internal toter storage for the apartments and we don't anticipate like huge needs for eight units and six units. So uh, we don't see an issue with that. On the commercial side of things, we're in negotiations with home leasing to get a spot on in their parking lot for a dumpster should that need arise. Uh, it sort of depends on the uses of the commercial rentals, but that's the other half of the trash conversation. So we're, we're concerned also about where those totes go on the day that the waste hauler comes to pick them up. Um, so um, if, you, if you look at the mixed use development manual, they're supposed to be to the side or the rear of the buildings. Um, but if you drive by on the day that the trash is picked up for the front building, um, all those totes are out in front and it's not a very good site. It's mm -hmm. not very reflective of Understood. What, the, what the town was looking for. So, you know, we like to see something in um, some revised documentation that would specify, um, you know, where the trash is, is collected and how it's disposed of. Yep, no, understood. And and like I said, I think that's something we'd like to confirm with the team here when we were going through as we respond to the, the PRC comments. And I figured it would come up in discussion tonight. Um, so that's something we'd like to look at, making sure that we can provide a spot that's, that's uh, I'm gonna, I'll call it not front and center. <laughs> okay. And what about lighting for these two buildings? Um, there, so basically there are some existing light poles that were installed for the parking areas that were, um, for the parking spaces that are adjacent to the, both those buildings. A couple of them will require to be relocated based just based on these new building footprints, um, which will provide parking area lighting. And then um, the building lighting is just uh, sec like security building lighting and entrance lighting at, at underneath the canopies and the doorways. So what about some safety illumination for the occupants of the building that could be working nights and coming at all different kinds of hours? Yeah, I think that's sort of what Mike's describing is yep. there's, there's lights at all the doorways basically, but they would just be small accent lights, not you know, we're not trying to light any sidewalks or parking lots with any of those lights. They're not big wall packs, but these are, you know, at every door you'd, you'd have a sort of a light fixture, either a sconce fixture on the pedestrian spine side, or you'd have sort of a overhead fixture in a canopy. 
So illumination of the sidewalks is a requirement of the mixed-use development manual. Right. So I think, sorry, to, to clarify, our, we are, there's no sidewalks really like on our site that aren't already lit by existing lighting. So the lighting that I'm talking about is just accent lighting that would be directly mounted to the building, illuminating the sidewalk directly at a door. The pedestrian spine and the sidewalks that are around Penfield Square are already lit by the lights that Mike was talking about. Correct. Well, I have AJ. Okay, I have a couple of questions. What's the height of the first floor? 12 foot eight is the floor to floor, so we have a higher floor for the commercial uses. You say 12 foot eight? I think that's right. <laughs> you might have them on the elevations there. Okay. Um, I just have the total on here. Where? Where will residents be encouraged to park? Can I turn that over to you, Lewis? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, initially, the site itself, so each one of the two sites has its own parking spots. So my thought would be to have maybe, so in the front building, I think there's 14 spots maybe. So maybe we would dedicate six spots to the residents. The additional six. Eight like, spots for commercial. Yeah, exactly. And then the rest is all shared parking. So if there was two people living in one apartment, so they would have one spot up front. The second spot would be, you know, the shared corner. parking. Wherever okay. they, I mean, it could be in the back, could be off to right. the side. I mean, wherever they, they choose to park. Okay. So you're thinking about parking for commercial tenants and customers and that sort right. of thing. Right. So that, um, you know, even though it's all shared parking, people do want it, especially, uh, well, if you're a resident, you want it convenient, and also if you're a customer, you want it convenient. So, all right. Yeah, the idea is some of those would probably overlap too, right? So somebody leaves for work at 7 right. a.m. We're not anticipating any business that would open up before 7. Um, right. You know, if it's, so if just it's doctors uh, or... Just a point of clarification, we did grant them approval to modify the site plans to add some additional parking after we approve the overall project. So, so they could be added. Um, where, do you know where people are parking now on the site, typically? What, what just spots are used the most? Just from general observations from, from doing the, the plans, I, I believe a lot of the tenants park on the north side of the the, the uh, Penfield Square I'm, mm -hmm. IL building. Um, that where it seems to where be a, be a lot of the the parking is currently just from general visiting the site, um, which does leave. I was going to mention that does leave a lot of the parking around that center green area available. That is adjacent to both these buildings, so there are the right. parallel spots along that entrance, eastern entrance around that that center green area that's adjacent to lot four. And then there is the parking area that, like Jim mentioned, that we modified on the west side of that center green area that added some parking <clears throat> additional spots from what was originally proposed um, that faces the pedestrian spine, faces the commercial use along that, that lot three building too, so. Okay. And then architecturally, you know, I think uh, we're going to need to have Chris yeah. Lopez comment on this as we are having him comment on every application in the mixed-use district. But um, me not being an architect, but the that um, vertical board and batten on building four or the site four seems... You know, would you consider stone or something to kind of break it up and make it look a little um, I don't know more elegant I guess so what we were trying to do is areas basically that are commercial have the stone and or masonry on both the front and rear building so 
if you look at these elevations here, that center section that you actually see with the doorway and canopy, that's actually the residential entry there, and then the, the two pieces with the signage are to the right. So, I mean, we could look at something like that, but just to give you a little bit more of the design logic, that's where that was coming from. So that center piece there is all residential, and then the two sides flanking it have the stone where the commercial uses are. So just, again, open to, I think open to the idea, but that was the design logic. Okay. All right, any, you, um, Yeah, I have a, a couple questions. Do you have any, um, back to the parking, do you have any electric car charging stations? None are currently proposed. Um, that's not to say that as Lewis gets the sites developed that they couldn't be installed or that, I mean, I don't think there's anything stopping the existing Penfield Square. I think there are some. Is there? I think. I, I'm pretty sure that with the parking lot that you mentioned, Jim, that that section that we added, there are four electric charging stations, which would be just east of Parcel Three. I want to say that that's where they're installed. But looking yeah, at and that. you know, this is going to become more and more of an issue, as you guys know. Sure. Right. So, yep. at least if you rough in the feed, even if you don't put the charging stations in, we have projects all over the country. You can't buy these charging stations. They're, they're just not available. But at least if you, if you come back and tell the board that you're gonna rough them in, then you can accommodate the future installation. Yeah, without digging everything back yeah. up. It, right. it's, a good, it's a good thought, it's a good yeah. Thought, yeah. And then um, just in terms of a traffic perspective, so you have the YMCA, the current Penfield Square, these two proposed new buildings, an application for the other side of the street, one exit and one entrance for everything. So do you, how is traffic flow now with the YMCA? With um, so, I mean, the overall site layout for the, I'm gonna say the overall Penfield Square development anticipated these buildings to be constructed. Um, so you do have the shared YMCA way, which is the main thoroughfare between the YMCA and the Penfield Square development but both buildings have multiple entrances into them. If you look at the overall site plan, the lot four closest to 250, primarily we'll use this eastern entrance, I'm gonna call it that, that for that center green area, but that's not stopping anybody from pulling in the western entrance and looping around. Um, there is two-way traffic around the north side of the IL building, the AL building, and um, so there is a good circulation of traffic. It's not just a one-way entrance into each building mm -hmm. or out of each building area, so that way um, generally traffic can flow basically around the site. So actually, somebody, one of the town staff members brought this up but, um, with respect to um, maintaining the flow for the current residents and, and During, during and construction. But, there's actually a provision in the fire code mm -hmm. that requires you to maintain um, emergency access and pedestrian access um, and the means of egress um, throughout all the existing buildings during construction. So um, you're gonna need to prepare uh, a safety plan that shows your staging areas and your storage areas and your trailers and your portable toilet facilities and everything um, and that that's going to be a condition. Uh, yeah, of course. Of course. The um, we did read the comment and the PRC comment that we received, um, and I think that's something that we can respond to and address with either with plan revisions or in writing, or also at the time of the pre-construction meeting between contractors and town staff um, to review those the sequence of construction steps that are outlined on our site plans um, that will, that can identify the, like you said, the staging areas and construction entrances and the fact that the entrances do need to be maintained open for, for access for the, the ex yeah. other. Just for, yeah. for, for point of contention, it, yep. they need to be documented on a plan ahead of time. Understood. Um, but, uh, uh, the other th obvious thing, I think this is where you were going, is you don't plan on building both of these at the same time, right? Um, maybe not. 
simultaneously at the same time. But yes, I mean, the, the, the thought is not to build one, finish it, and then start the other one. Okay, but so your safety during construction plan needs to encompass all of those areas. Uh, Bob? <clears throat> just a few comments It might have been covered in the PRC, I'm not sure. Just on the different pages, the accessible spaces, I think I figured out, but it looks like they didn't carry through to all of the um, different pages on okay. the site plan. And the... The buildings, are both buildings going to have full service elevators? Just the rear building. So the rear building with corridor style has uh, an elevator that goes to first, second, third floor. The front building with the townhouse style units does not have an elevator. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Would anyone in the audience like to comment on this application? Okay, let me see if we have any calls. We have no calls and no electronic submissions. Let me remind the folks at home, it's 585-340-8771. Uh, or penfield.org. And you can uh, submit a comment electronically. Uh, there should be a link to this meeting on the homepage of the website. Um, no other comments from the board? Do you have any uh, closing comments? Uh, no closing comments. Um, we appreciate the input from the board. Uh, we'll work on addressing some of the board comments along with the PRC comments. Um, we'll look to town staff for the, um, the architectural review from Chris Lopez. I know that's one of the things that you had mentioned, AJ. Um, so we'll look to follow up on that and then work towards getting some responses before before uh, the next the next meeting. Sounds great. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Okay. So For us to finish up here, um, do we want to uh, go through some of the items that we want to incorporate in a tabling resolution now? Do we want to uh, sit on this, absorb it, and gather our, our wits for our work session on I, the 24th? I can't, uh, I, I can't fashion a list of items for a tabling resolution because I, I really didn't get a chance to look at this until late this afternoon. Yeah. So, um, so and do that, we need to, after a public hearing, we probably, we need to table, but um, we, uh, what I'd like to do is, is table pending further input on a sure I guess a more table, involved uh, table uh, for you know pending consideration of a more formal tabling resolution or right for lack of a better right well it's just it's it's, yeah, it's, it's table to, 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 to afford the board yeah. a, a greater opportunity to review the information yeah yeah <laughs> okay why don't we start with the first one that was um, 1527 Fire Boulevard? Yes. So that's Bob's. Yes. And with that, um, just quickly, is uh, engineering and staff comfortable with where they're going and what they've submitted? Yeah. I mean, we were really wanting that uh, 
since they already added the pavement. Mm -hmm. um, we had concerns with that steep slope, and so they, uh, Mark Valentine wanted, he requested that stone diaphragm to be installed at the end of the parking lot. So okay. since they are amenable to doing that, then we're, we're protecting the steep slope, and we have a little ease of the water that's going to run off there. So. Okay, so with that, is there any other major concerns from I, I staff? I know that you have the concern about the driveway. dirty area. Right. Well, the, the driveway. <laughs> so basically the old driveway went straight out. It's paved including past the sidewalk to Empire. If you're on the site to the left, they probably added I don't know, two and a half, three feet of asphalt. The asphalt goes up to the sidewalk, which is, of course, within the right of way. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of the sidewalk, between the sidewalk and Empire, it's mud, it's dirt. So you've got almost a three foot. I mean, from the property line to where they put in the asphalt? or from toward the, the interior of the site to the sidewalk? If you draw a straight lines out from where the asphalt is now for the driveway, on the left-hand side, between the sidewalk and Empire, it's just dirt. And it's, I don't know, it's probably a foot, 18 inches, I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean, I made that comment on you provided new asphalt on the back side of the sidewalk. What have you done on the interior? Because I wanted to know if they needed to get a DOT permit. Well, nobody wants to ever get a DOT permit because that's a six month process. So they basically widened, if you want to call it, well, I guess it is a curb cut. They're existing. They widened it by right. roughly three, two and a half, three feet. So do we, What's the board's thoughts on, do we ask them to remove that and put it to the existing edge of the site driveway? What do they really gain by adding this two and a half feet of pavement? They said, well, when I asked them, they said people were going off the edge and going into the mud on their site with, you know, on their side of the um, right away. So this was, I mean, years ago, this was previously a residence. Um, these residences, many of them were converted, converted for commercial uses. Um, so prior to it uh, being um, Dr. Sahar's facility, medical facility, it was, uh, I believe it was a uh, rug and floor care. No, this uh, was, that was to no, the north. that was to the north. I was, yeah, wrong. Um, so many of these sort of still have residential curb cuts. Right. Um, so it was likely never widened to meet a commercial curb cut standard. So if we're looking at that plan there, mm -hmm. right. Catherine, if you could zoom in a little bit on the entrance. Yeah, great. So the area of asphalt added since last survey, that's the area that they've added, right? Yes. And Bob, you're talking about where you're concerned is the, if uh, up is north and down is south, and the sidewalk is the dashed line, or no? The sidewalk's not shown. Yeah, sidewalk's the sidewalk shown. is basically the yeah. back, or it's in front of that dark black property line. Is the sidewalk. Why is there a sidewalk you say in easement? Front of, are you talking about to the right of it, to the east of it? Or are you talking about to yeah, the Yeah, it's like where the 81.70, right yeah. that's yeah. where the sidewalk is. Okay. Catherine's it's pulling up a site for her an aerial. And the sidewalks were installed in the right of way as opposed to on the property. So why why is this a big hardship for them to get a DOT permit? They've already done the work. They're already occupying the property. They're already occupying the business. It's, it's not going to slow them down. No. Why, why, yeah, it's like, why wouldn't you condition them to get a commercial wide with, you know, curb cut. 
Right. I mean, that's a DOT. They need to chime in on what they feel is appropriate. So it's their show. I don't know. That was just you know my observation. Well, right. Yeah. I, I agree with your observation. Well, and it makes sense. If somebody cuts that corner, just like you said. It's um, going to be a big pothole. Yep. Yep, and that's a hazard. So, I mean, we're not holding them up, right? We could, we could make this a condition of approval. For them to get a DOT permit to fill Well, that. for them to make the improvement, whatever they got to do to make the improvements that we think are necessary. Um, I don't know if we have right a justification over a DOT right away. That's something that's... Except well, if they're widening that, then if they want to widen it, if they don't get that revised curb cut, then they would have to take that out. The existing added asphalt. Right, right. Well, to me, it doesn't make any sense to have that asphalt at the moment Correct. because you get a, you get into the site, and who's going to use that unless they need to get around somebody coming out at the same time? They had two ton of asphalt it's... left over when they were there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking. Was. But yeah, so uh, they need to come back with a with a revised site plan anyhow because they need to show the handicap accessible parking and loading zone in, in that location and the signage <coughs> is the signage there Bob uh, no no okay so all, all that needs to be added to the to the plan and, and those improvements need to be made anyhow uh, I mean we can make the I think we can make the recommendation that they strongly you know take a look at their entrance to the property and obtain whatever necessary permits from the DOT to make it a safe a full, and... A full width widening right. of the, the entrance. Right. <clears throat> I agree, Bob. Yeah, okay. Let's at least put that in our tabling resolution yeah. so that they, okay. they know. Anything, that's about it with yeah. us, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You wanna make sure. the motion? Uh, motion to uh, prepare the table in resolution as we described. We have a second. I'll second. All right. She's Hetsky. getting Hetsky aye. Aiken. Aiken aye. Burton. Burton aye. Knauer. Knauer aye. You're starting to get used to like getting your name in the minutes. I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, second one. <clears throat> The uh, dry cleaners. Um, we want to discuss that further at uh, when we're fresh at the work session. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I would tend to agree there's, with that. There's, there's a number of things going on here that need to be further absorbed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, would you like to motion to table? Motion to table. I'll make the motion to table for further discussion. I'll second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Hetsky? Aye. Aiken? Aiken, aye. Burton? Burton, aye. Knauer? Knauer, aye. Item three, the car wash. Same deal. Um, I will, um, I guess this is my application, so. I'll move to table pending further discussion and uh, uh, preparation of comments. Yeah, well, as long as we're on the topic, not that we need to add it to the tabling resolution, but I'd, I'd be very interested in seeing what you could do with, with the maintenance of that service road. That's actually something that I'd... Uh, we, we definitely want to put into the tabling resolution. And if we don't start... Now, uh, the last person that goes in that is going to get stuck 
Well, you know, I don't know what authority so we have to regulate. The it. property with the maintenance road, though, is not is not, not before us. So yeah. right. So we, we need to find a way to, to mm. create some wording that uh, that makes this an issue. Whether whether we can compel this applicant to. I mean, I, they're not going to enter into a maintenance agreement with the town for property they don't own, but somehow or other, we got to find a way to try to advance this because right. it really is a mess. It, it is a mess, and we need to. We can't just. To me, we're kicking the can down the road. We're we're um, somehow we got to come up with a solution. We can't all just say, "Oh, geez, well." We don't have any control over the property, but we let everybody use it. And Does the town already have an easement over it? You said, Mike. I don't. I don't know if we have an e. Well, we might have an easement over it, but I don't know what the easement actually says. So there's been a lot of communication between the DPW director on because for some reason we plow this road, but we don't necessarily have to maintain it. Yeah. Hmm. So the, his, the history of this road is a little convoluted. Right. Um, so unfortunately, I think because the part that we're concerned about is on another property, once that property comes in for site plan approval, then that's when we can get the property maintenance agreement. So then at least all the parcels that are adjacent to that road or abutting that road or encompass that road will have some legal aspect of being able to force them to maintain their portion of it. So here's what I say. Don't we have... Uh, I'll, I'll, let me just finish this thought. Allowing somebody to approvals to create a service entrance exit onto a service road that's not suitable for motor vehicle traffic would violate about five ASHTO requirements on its own, I but, mean. But the, this car wash doesn't, well, I guess I haven't been driving down where the old cobblestone or whatever it was, restaurant, uh, Cornerstone or whatever, that how that road is. But it's I know bad. it gets pretty bad in the back. Um, it's pretty bad but, in the front now. Yeah, um, yeah but So bad that if you drove down there, you'd have to cut across the parking lot of the old restaurant to try to, to get out of there without sacrificing right, but I, all your that, car. Yeah, I think we only have an access easement. I don't think we have anything else. And somewhere when that road was in, uh, you know, inception of that road, somehow we got into plowing it for some reason, and nobody knows why. So the the access road between the former Cornerstone property and the car wash property, there's some potential because they they do own like half of it or something on that north side. Well, not uh, not based on their site plan. Not based on their site plan. No, it basically ends right at the edge of their green grass there. Hmm. So most of that is on the Cornerstone property where... They do, they do show, it looks like it's... So, so we need to look back at the LUAMP. Right. Mm -hmm. And find out what exactly was set out mm -hmm. for that. And, and, and how that easement is worded, maybe. Yeah. Right. And so if I'm the person who owns that, why would I spend my money maintaining it for other people? I don't care. Well, right. So, so I mean, unfortunately, being... whenever that site plan came in, the mentality of the town at that time was for A, right? So now we've learned from that, that site plan that, that A doesn't work. We need to come up with plan B. And so when, unfortunately, we need to have that property come in for a review of something. Well, Catherine, pull that boundary back up. You just had. Giddy up. Yeah, according uh, to their, it looks like according to their survey map, they do own a portion of that road, and they certainly we could. go by that. See what we could do along that. This is GIS section. mapping? Huh? This is from pictometry? Yeah. Yes. They're pretty accurate. 
but then if we go to their site plan, they're I think our site plan indicates that they they chose partial ownership of that entry road, but they only have partial ownership of the entry road. They don't have any access to the road to the rear of them, and as they said, they at this point they don't even have an access easement to it to show their. I mean, they show their <coughs> emergency exit um, bailout but they don't have an easement to allow that bailout at this point. You're right, you know, they, they own a portion on, of it. They show that bailout based on a future access easement with the- By the way, I, I, think, it's, I think it's to the, uh, the benefit of the community to see if we can't push that. I think this is I, mm -hmm. our opportunity. I just don't know how. You but, guys will figure it out, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> These are all professional. <laughs> I guess we'll figure it out. <laughs> I, we do have to come up with a solution for this. Oh, I agree. There's, there's, uh, I mean, it looks to me like the old restaurant is one parcel, and then does uh, Jim Trow still own that other part? Yeah. Yeah. I think he still owns both of them. Both well, of them? I think it's currently... For sale, or if not, just recently sold. So, which one, twenty-one thirty, or the back portion? The back portion, where their old boneyard was back there. You mean? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we don't need to. We don't have to, to belabor it all, all but we have. This is something that we need to figure out as a town. Yep. That if we're if we have new develop new developments here, and we're expecting uh, the public to use these roads, there's got to be some type of reasonable way that the public can expect to not destroy their vehicles. You should see what the easement say. Right. Yeah. And I'll talk to the DPW director because I know he's pretty knowledgeable of the road and why we plow it and all that. I just okay. don't know that. Okay. So do we have a second on this? Uh... Second. Okay, good. Moved in second. Hetsky. Hetsky, aye. Aiken. Aiken, aye. Burton. Burton, aye. Knauer. Knauer, aye. Okay. Penfield Square, three, four. Penfield Square, three and four. Um, I move to table pending uh, further review, review by the board. I'll second that. Okay, moved and seconded. Hetsky. Hetsky, aye. Aiken. Aiken, aye. Burton. Burton, aye. Knauer. Knauer, aye. Okay, I think we're good. Nothing else? Nothing That's all else for you guys tonight. Nothing else to cover tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for hanging out. Your participation. Catherine was bored. And uh, <laughs> we will adjourn. Our meeting is adjourned. See you in two weeks. So.